Governor Wike says Obasanjo's endorsement of Peter Obi speaks volume as the former president publicly announces support for the presidential candidate of the Labour Party. And also we discuss uh, with the House of Representatives candidate of the Accord Party in River State, Naku Paul Birabi, as he talks about his plans for the federal constituency of Kana and Gokana. This is Plus Politics and I'm Mary Anako. A uh, much touted cleanup of oil pollution in southern Nigeria is yet to start in parts of the hotspot, especially Ogoni, almost three years after contracts were handed out and residents remain without proper drinking water, according to reports. Nigeria's Africa, uh, Africa's biggest crude producer, uh, we have struggled with oil spills for decades, triggering social unrest and even militancy across the Niger Delta. Now, the kingdom of Ogoni land in River State, home to about a million people, is still in chaos even after several allocations. Well, joining us to discuss his plans to revive Ogoni land tonight is House of Representatives candidate of the Accord Party in River State, Naku Paul Birabi. Naku, it's so good to have you join us. Good evening. Good evening. Great. Um, first, first things first. Um, there are a lot of people who would look at you and ordinarily not see um, someone who is a career politician, but you might correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so my first question is, why did you decide to go into politics? The thing is, I have to remind myself what I'm doing this for. Um, having spent 15 years um, in and around government in Nigeria, I have seen firsthand what can be done when people in power have the best interest of the electorate at heart. So I suppose uh, for me, it's just about giving back, but giving back in a way that can be amplified. You don't need to be in power to effect change on your community or your society, but being in power actually amplifies that effect by a thousandfold thereabout. So it's having responsible representative leadership that can drive forward policies and programs that influence the people and the lives of the people, the, the everyday lives of the people. Um, I have spent, uh, as I say, spent time um, in and around government. I worked as a legislative aide in Bayasa State um, House of Assembly. I was responsible for corporate communications in um, River State Sustainable Development Agency. And then I worked very closely with His Excellency Governor Lee Limoke for seven years in Cross River State, um, responsible for a brief which covered things ranging from the environment to MDGs, now SDGs, um, education policy, um, as well as my, you know, uh, run on the bill um, role as his administrative support. So, as I say, I've seen firsthand what good, benevolent, representative government can do and that's in a sense is my reason that's why i'm getting into this hmm. it's interesting that also this uh, 2023 elections has presented an opportunity for a lot of newcomers um, especially young people to pick up tickets in different political parties across the board uh, but let's talk about the the newcomers part of it it's very very difficult i must say um, especially being that nigeria has for a long time had two for, for a long time, one major political party, then, of course, the APC came, and so it's now two major political parties, even though the other political parties will say what makes them major. But how easy has it been for you as a newcomer to break ground in terms of running for an office as, you know, as high as a member representing, you know, Kana and Gokana in River State? I would say that it's been, it's been tough, but I never expected it to be easy. Um, the, I, I say this. The game wasn't desi designed for people like me to win. So we can't play according to the rules. We've been fortunate in this electoral cycle that the um, Electoral Act has been passed. And if properly implemented, the will of the people will prevail. Um, uh, we're hopefully going to eliminate a lot of electoral irregularities around 
ballot box snatching, accreditation of voters, that sort of thing. I think it presents a great opportunity for people like me to come up, uh, present their case to the people, try and convince people, and um, see if I can win the hearts and minds of the electorate and, and get their votes, and as a result, get the mandate. Um, coming from a small party, obviously, you know, we've got challenges in terms of finance and structure. But what we lack in terms of those challenges, we make up for significantly in effort. And I, I actually think it's a great sign of the maturity of, the, of our nascent democracy, that people are given a choice. People can understand that they can choose some other party apart from the two big juggernauts that we have. Uh, and to be fair, in the last how many years, those two big juggernauts haven't really represented the needs of Nigerian people. So I think this is the sort of time when we can start looking elsewhere. And it, it's, it's having the bravery to look elsewhere. It's having the bravery to, to say, okay, those two parties don't reflect me. Let's look for a candidate in a party that we can support that reflects me. Okay. Let's talk about... Um Accord. Why accord? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people would wonder, ah, the, the newest baby that seems to be, you know, um, a, a movement of sorts that's, that's created a movement is the Labour Party. And a lot of people have gone in that direction. Uh, and then the next new thing is the NNPP. Why the Accord Party? In a state that is mostly a PDP state, even the APC has only held sway just you know a little bit but it's been a pdp state for the longest time that we can remember um why did you choose the accord party well i'm not one to jump on the bandwagon um i would i i subscribe to a path that reflects what i'm trying to do so just because the labor party is popular now doesn't mean it's going to be popular in four years um, and it also doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to be um um uh, an electoral success across the country. So it's not about jumping on the bandwagon. For the other party you mentioned as well, yes, okay, they might be trending in certain parts, but that's not really the substance of what I'm trying to achieve with this representative democracy. Um, the Accord Party at, in River State is quite flexible, so it gives the candidates the opportunity to present themselves in a way that is unique to their constituents, so that, that there's that direct connection between the candidate and the people he's looking to represent. So there isn't like a top-down instruction coming from central office somewhere in Abuja telling you must do this, that, and the other. And I, I think it's really about bringing democracy, a representative democracy, closer to the people, so the people can feel the fabric of the cloth of the of their representatives. And for me, I was looking for a party that could give me that flexibility, that could give me the platform um, to to be more in touch with the people. And that's, I suppose, that's the Accord Party. Um, again, still staying with the issue of the Accord Party. Um, for someone who's lived in River State for a couple of years, I would say um, that, it, in fact, it's a Nigerian thing where people have been acclimatized to voting for a certain or for voting in a certain direction. Um, what are you going to do to um, sway the average Rivers voter, especially people in Kana and Gokana, uh, to vote the Accord Party? Um, again, how do you even, where do you start from? Because I'm curious. Um, for example, you're running against yeah. a, a Dumna, um, you know, um, what's his name, Deco, uh, who's a member of the PDP, and he's been there yes. for how long? So how do you even start to sway the people of Kana, and what do you bring to the table that's different from what every other member of the Repre House of Representatives who's run for that office has brought to the table? That's a, that's a serialized question. So it comes in episodes, and I'll try and take it as you asked it. So first of all, I think people are disenfranchised from the two big parties in River State, particularly. Um, um, I think people are looking for an option. Um, yes, they've got the strengths. I'm not denying that. They are very powerful. PDP has run this state for, you know, since, since the onset of this new democratic dispensation. So it's going to be an uphill task. Um, but I think that they also carry a lot of baggage of disappointment. So people have tried them, they've been tested, the electorate has tested them, and more often than not, they have disappointed the electorate. So, um, I mean, if, you, if we sort of project this macro to the whole country, um, 
the reason why the Labour Party is enjoying as much support as or attention as it is now is because the two big parties have failed to, to meet the expectations of Nigerians. Mm -hmm. When you granulate it to River State, um, the the party here has dominated, but uh, monopoly is not necessarily a good thing. People have to have a choice. Uh, people have to have that option. And I think people are willing to exercise that option now. Again, supported by, if properly implemented, the Electoral Act. Um, so that's that part of your question. Um, how do I plan to unseat someone? I don't know. I think the real challenge here, and if I flip the question is, what has that person done in the time they've been there? It'd be interesting if my opponent could come up with his legislative report for the last four years. We haven't seen anything. It'd be interesting if he could point to a constituency project and constituency. We haven't seen anything. It'd be interesting if he could talk about the last time he had held a town hall meeting with his constituents. I haven't heard anything. It'd be interesting if you could talk about the last time you stood on the floor of the house to talk about anything regarding the constituency. I haven't seen any video clips anywhere. So what is representation? Who is he representing, himself or his people? That's the question I would ask. It's a challenge, and that's why I'm the challenger, because I'm challenging his record. I'm looking at his record, and there's nothing to see. So in that sense, my job is to show people that you just have a figurehead. You don't have a representative. Because if you did have a representative, a lot of your problems would be solved. Hmm. Uh, since he's not here, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. So um, sometime in 2021, he had said, I'm talking about uh, the PDP um, member representing Kana Kana Federal Constituency, that uh, Right Honorable Dumnaneme, uh, I hope I didn't kill his name, uh, Deco. Dumnaneme Deco. Yes, he's, Dumnamene Deco, he, he yes. said that the PDP has no opposition in Kana. Now, he's also gone ahead to talk about um, federal government interventions in the Niger Delta, especially uh, in Kana and Gokana, especially in Ogoni land. He's, ta he's talked about the federal government, um, you know, not intervening in the situation that, you know, Ogoni land is experiencing. And he talked about this also in 2021 uh, when he was making a case during the PIB. I'm the devil's advocate right now. Um, he's also <laughs> talked about the fact that the president... President Muhammad Buhari needs to, uh, he pushed for the he, president's accent for, uh, you know, the electoral act when, you, you know, the federal um, government was dragging its feet to pen its accent to that particular bill. So these are some of the things to mention, but a few. I'm not in any way trying to hold brief for him, but um, these are some of the things that have been recorded that he's talked about. He's also talked about, you know, his legacies. Um, um, you know, as a member representing that constituency. But who am I? I'm not from Gokana, nor am I from Kana, but I just wanted to, you know, put, put that out there. Well, he's talked about it, but can he articulate it? Is there a constituency report anywhere we could read this? What's the accessibility to the electorate? And you can talk about all these things, but what do you do about them? Talking is cheap. What do you actually do about them? You know, it's not about outcomes. It's about impact. So you can say all these things, but what is the impact on the lives of the people that you represent? Mm. How do they connect with you? What, you know, what are you saying, really? What's the subtext of all these you know, grandiose speeches that you make? I mean, I, I have nothing against the man, and I'd, I'd, I'd rather play the ball than the man. So that's why I'm playing the ball. And the ball is, what has he done in the last four years? I'd like to see it so that I can challenge it, so that I can scrutinize it. That's what I want to do. And it's, it, the, the onus is on him to say that he's done well and show that he's done well and prove it as well. The onus isn't on me to, to and my, the onus on me rather, is to call him out where I think he hasn't done well. And I've just said that. Um, you can't represent people you're not talking to. So how does he know what the concerns of the people are at home if he hasn't held a town hall meeting or a constituency meeting? It's not about going to people's birth, uh, Thanksgivings or funerals. It's about connecting with the people in a forum that gives them the opportunity to voice their concerns, to mm. voice their priorities for development. And that's what it is. I think we, we must tell ourselves the truth. If we're not being adequately represented, we must stand up and hold our leaders to account. And I actually think the problem here with our representative democracy, it isn't the politicians, right? They'll do whatever they can get away with, really. You know, I mean, turkeys aren't going to vote for Christmas. It's actually not the um the electorate because a lot of our electorate aren't really educated or exposed enough to be able to ask the right questions 
it's the thought leaders and opinion formers like me and you, right? You know, those of us who are the commentariat, who aren't equipping the electorate with the right information to be able to ask the right questions, and who also aren't asking the right questions of our leaders. Okay. And you have this sort of middlemen, an industry of middlemen who profiteer of this asymmetric information. And that is why whenever you go to a community, you have to see certain people before you can enter. <laughs> what stops you from walking on the street and actually interacting with real people who would vote for you? And I think we, this new generation, this new crop of politicians, have to tell themselves the truth. And we have to find a way to connect with the people that really matter. So in that sense, um, you know, we can, we can talk about it all we want, but we have to show what we are willing to do. And what okay. I'm willing to do is simple. Um, Ogoni land at the moment, uh, um, there's a disconnect between our educational attainment and our level of development. And that mm. disconnect is leadership. That's the bridge over that gap. And it's about a qualitative leadership that impacts on the lives of the people. So I'm looking at things, I'm looking at interventions around education, for example. So you go around most of the community secondary schools in, in the constituency and they've got no roofs. I mean, you know, I could have sent you the pictures if I wanted to be controversial, but you know, um, anyone could go investigate, you know. That's not really difficult to solve. That's not rocket science. How are kids supposed to study in an environment that isn't conducive for learning? You know, it's simple things. And that's, I, I suppose, the most frustrating thing about this is that the opportunities you have to really impact on the lives of people require very little effort. They just require thought and political will. But, 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 people, but that, that's mostly the job of states, local governments, not, not necessarily, necessarily legislative the job of a, the, duties. The job of a, I mean, they have the constitutional duties in that direction, not necessarily. The job of a representative is to represent his people at all levels. So well, there's yeah. nothing wrong with the House of Rep member talking to his state governor about the plight of schools in his constituency. Agreed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That Agreed. is what he should be doing. Uh, and I think this is, a, this is the crux of it. And not to get too philosophical about it, but we loan our, our, our leaders power. Every four years, it's like a bank. You go to a bank, you take a loan. You are supposed to you know, use that money, invest it, whatever, get your returns and pay your loan back, right? We loan our leaders power every four years. Mm -hmm. We say, take this power, go and represent us. But if they default on that loan because they're not representing us and they're representing special interests or their pockets or whatever, whatever the case may be, then we have a right to call back that loan after four years, mm -hmm. right? And we have a right to not give them back that loan. Okay. And for me, I think, as I say, I, I, I want to play the ball, not the man, because he's a, he's a great guy. I mean, I, I have known him. Um, in fact, we spent part of Christmas together. He came uh, to the house to see my father and we, you know, we had a conversation and it was actually great that two contenders could sit down and, and parley and, and break bread without any animosity. So okay. it's not about him, but in every family, when you have someone who isn't playing their part, you call a family meeting and you say, bros, um, you know, it isn't quite working out. So someone else is going to have to do this. It's, there's, no, there's no bad blood, no ill feeling. It's a family. We're all, as a good people, we're a family. Okay. But we have to tell ourselves the truth as a family. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying you've done your turn. It hasn't quite worked out because you haven't really met the expectations of people. Let someone else go. Okay. Let's quickly talk in the next few minutes about your Ogoni Revival plan for Kana and Gokana. Yes, yes. I scrolled through it. Um, I saw agriculture, education, um, economic mm -hmm. opportunities and job creation, um, consolidating democracy. That actually st uh, stood out to me uh, because, you know, anybody can tell me that they want to help develop the education sector and blah, blah, blah. But how do you consolidate on the gains of people who actually have done the job before you? Uh, well, not those who are just there to hold power, but those who've done the job well. And how do you consolidate? It's interesting you say. Gains? It's interesting you say done the job well because a lot of what I get as a young candidate coming in, and I'm not really young. I'm in my forties, but you know, in Nigeria, the old men like to infantilize us young men and make us feel like we're, you know, still in our nappies. The point is, um, a lot of these people got power way younger than I am right now. 
but they've refused to move on or hand over the baton to the next generation. And that's why I said the game isn't designed for young people. The game today isn't designed for young people like me to win. Um, and going back to your point about consolidating democracy based on experience, the experience, the, 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 I suppose, criticism thrown is, oh, you're, you're inexperienced. Well, I'd rather take someone with new ideas than someone who has bad experience, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen thus far has been a great deficit between what is promised and what's delivered. For me, consolidating democracy means you're bringing power closer to the people. So the people have a direct impact on who represents them. They have direct access to who represents them. And there are mechanisms in place for their voices to be heard, which is why I talk about constituency, ass citizens' assemblies, for example, in the constituency, where my plan is every quarter, um, non-political members of the, the constituency. So no one in the political party, I'm talking about farmers and fishermen, I'm talking about you know school teachers. They come together as the voice of the, the constituency to prioritize their needs. And that's fed through to their representative, hopefully me, um, through uh, a town hall session, which will be happening twice a year. Because if you aren't talking to the people about what their needs are, then what are you doing in Abuja? Like, who are you talking for if you're not talking to the people? And I think this is a very simple concept. It's not rocket science. It's, it's what happens right across the world in a bit more mature democracies. But there's no reason why we can't leapfrog. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've seen these things working. They're a great way to get people participating in democracy. And I think that it's, it's one of the things I would like to institute. Another thing, perhaps, for a different conversation is the recall. So people should be able to put in a petition and recall their representatives if they don't feel they're doing well. But that's indeed another conversation. That's a conversation for another day. Trust me, it's indeed a, a whole no, no, yeah, yeah. other that's kettle of another conversation for another day. Yes. So, but, so but, that's about consolidating democracy. It's about yeah. it's about reinforcing the confidence people have in their representatives and the system of representation. Finally, for agriculture, Oguni. Oguni is a massive. Sorry, let me just make yeah. this point. Oguni is a massive agrarian society, right? For, for such a long time, uh, our curse has been that we've exploited the resource under the ground and we haven't done as much with the resources on the ground. So we focused a lot on oil and not enough on agriculture. And we've got huge swathes of arable land that could be cultivated. Unfortunately, the resource under the ground, the oil, has contaminated the ground. So it makes that difficult, which is why the work of IPREP is really important. And I wish the federal government would hasten that up because that would actually show people that there's more to life than the dependency on crude oil. Absolutely. So we're talking about you know, producing food for um, uh, mass production of food, basically. There isn't a single cassava processing plant in Aguni. Not one. Not a single one. There isn't necessarily an outgrowth scheme for any cash crop. I mean, it's just a, a complete and utter addiction to oil. And in the next few years, the EU passed a, the EU passed a policy a few years ago, saying I think it was by 2045 or something like that. You know, they were going to ban combustion engines or something, um, something to that effect. But the, the the world's dependency on oil is reducing with the emergence of electric vehicles. So what are we going to do when there's no market for the oil in the way in the in the magnitude or the quantities that we require to sustain ourselves? Mm -hmm. We have to pivot there's nothing we can chew gum and walk at the same time so we can still be you know um uh, uh, uh ex exploring the oil but we can also explore other economic act uh, activities for for Oguni. and in fact the proceeds from the oil should be funding a more sustainable development in the constituency um and that i suppose leads me into the industrialization strategy it's, I mean, it's, 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 again, it's not rocket science. You have jobs, you have industry that create jobs that employ the youth, that make them more productive economic agents in society. And it makes them less vulnerable to, you know, nefarious, you know, acts of, you know, violence or, you, you know, you know what I mean. If you don't see what to do, you do what you see. And I think um, hands that are, that are occupied aren't going to be ill-occupied with something else. But as I say, it's seeming to be a deliberate ploy to keep people in a state where they are dependent on handouts by, from politicians. And once you have the power and once you are 
sorry, once you are economically empowered as an individual, because you've got a job, you can pay your bills, you can take care of your kids, uh, feed your family, take care of your dependents, then you're less dependent on politicians' handouts. Mm. And that creates a more, a more healthy politics, a politics without thuggery, a politics without, you know, boys. You know, we need to, we really, really need to move on. The world is, has moved on and we're still in the dark ages in our politics. And it requires people, young people, getting more involved to actually push the dial in the direction we need to move. Well, I, I want to say that uh, there's so much to discuss. I would have loved to talk about more things. But then, of course, I'm sure that you would come back sometime soon and we'll have more uh, um, I'm happy to come back whenever you want. <laughs> okay. Well, Naku uh, is uh, the member, well, he's a House of Representatives candidate for the Accord Party in River State. Naku Paul Barabi, thank you so much for speaking with us. Unfortunately, we have to go now. Thank you very much, Miran. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be discussing the endorsement of Peter Obi by former President Olusha Gwon Basanger and claims of the G5 governors meeting up with the APC presidential candidate. Stay with us.